Um, apologies about that. We've got so many microphones being used this morning with all the different ministers that are taking part. Um, we're not familiar with this microphone, so sorry about that. Let me, let me kind of begin again, just so you can all hear me. A uh, very warm welcome to everybody this morning. Um, it's wonderful to come together uh, to worship God. Special welcome to the Right Reverend Dr. Richard Murray. I'll just give all the titles there just so we've, we've got that uh, clear. Uh, Richard, it's wonderful to have you uh, here. Somebody coming to represent uh, the wider church, and uh, it's wonderful to invite you to bring God's word to us this morning. Uh, also a special welcome then to our brothers and sisters from Second at St. Field. Um, it's really great to see uh, you coming uh, to, to come together this morning with us to worship God. I don't know when the last time it was that something like this happened, uh, but it's wonderful, I think, to have this fellowship uh, together this morning. Uh, and obviously, particularly, we're, we're doing that today uh, because we're looking ahead to our town mission that we're, we're doing, joining with uh, the parish church in 2025 to try and bring the gospel to our town. So it's wonderful to come together uh, to begin to think about that this morning. Uh, if you've got children with you this morning, um, please don't worry if they make a little bit of a noise uh, or whatever. Uh, there is a crash facility available uh, for you. If you would like to make use of that, feel free. And um, after the children's talk, our kids usually head out for Kid Zone just in our church halls. And uh, Second St. Field Kids, there's plenty of space for you to come and join in with that if you would like to this morning. Uh, a special welcome, finally, uh, to your minister, John, uh, who's uh, coming. And John, uh, it's great to have you with us. And I'll look forward to inviting you to lead us in prayer later on in our service. Well, as we gather together this morning, we remember that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The saints in heaven cast down their crowns, we read in Revelation, and they cry, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. As we come together to worship God, let's join together in prayer. Father Almighty, you are the maker of heaven and earth. And you have called us to your eternal glory in Christ. As we come into your presence today, we pray that we would be mindful of who you are and who we are as your people. Father, we pray that we would come together today with humble thanksgiving, recognizing that you are the Lord whose truth endures at all times. And we ask our Father that as we set our eyes on you today, that you would be pleased to do us good. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand then and sing our opening hymn, All People That On Earth Do Dwell, Psalm 100.
Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Almighty God, how wonderful it is that you have called us here into your presence that we might worship you. And we rejoice that you're not only doing this here, but that throughout the world on this day, you're drawing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to yourself so that they might know you and be blessed by you. We know that this is a most magnificent act of grace because as we have just sung, those whom you draw your, to yourself are held in your eyes as your people, as the sheep of your pasture. And we know it is grace because we know there is nothing within ourselves that enable, enables us to enjoy such a privileged position other than the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so, Jesus, it is because of you and in your name that we gathered here in such a blessed place. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the grace that you have shown us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for drawing us to yourself this morning. We thank you for making us a people. And we thank you that you have brought us here so that we might remember all that you have done for us in our Lord and Saviour. Heavenly Father, as we thank you, we must also confess that although we are your people, we have not always behaved as your people. We have seen in our lives how throughout the days and the weeks and even the months and the years that our eyes can drift away from you. And although we are made in your image, redeemed by Christ to bear your image, we confess that we have not always fully borne it. We confess how even this week, maybe even this day, we have willingly fallen into the old traps of sinfulness. We confess that we have carried the burden and weight of sin on our own. We confess how we have kept the good news of Jesus Christ to ourselves. Lord Jesus, we consider all you have done for us and the grace that you have shown us. We come before you willingly confessing our sins, willingly saying sorry to you for our sin. But we do so not only with a mind on what you have done for us, but because when we come to you and confess our sin, there is joy because there is forgiveness of sins in your name. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would assure us once again of the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus. And we pray that this day as we gather in his presence that we would cast our eyes upon him, that you would show us how he has freed us from the condemnation of sin, how he endured the pain of this world and is willing and able to help us as we endure it. And how he went through this world before us as a light to all. And Holy Spirit, we pray above all that you would remind us once again that through faith in him we are and always will be part of God's wonderful eternal people. Bless us in these ways, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. We'll hear what the Lord God says to those who have confessed their sins and placed their trust in the Lord Jesus. This is the word of God. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Isn't that wonderful that as we stand here in Christ, we belong to the Lord Almighty? Well, as we dwell upon his wonderful grace, I think the only thing we can do is praise him. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to stand and sing a praise together to our Lord and Savior, the words of our next hymn. Beholds our God.
to the part of our service now where we are going to hear God's word being read and then uh, opened up to us. So let's pray as we do that for God's help. Let, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do want to say thank you this morning for being our God, for inviting us to behold you, to know you, and indeed to share you with those around us. And so, Father, we want to pray just now as we come to your word, that it would come to us not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, so that with humble, teachable, and obedient hearts, we may receive what you have revealed, and always do what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament and from the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Uh, this is on page 652, if you're using one of these red pew Bibles. So Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to read from verse 7. Let's hear God's word. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the, in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. This is God's word. Well, in First St. Field, we ordinarily sing a psalm at this point in our service so that we not only hear God's word, but we also get to sing it. And this morning, we're going to sing from Psalm 126, a psalm that's all about a sower who goes out to sow the good seed of God's word. Um, you may not be familiar with the words, but hopefully the tune will be familiar. So let's stand and sing to God's praise. Oh, 
I'll say more later in the service just uh, by way of explanation for being here today, but it is a pleasure. And uh, I'll say also a word of thanks just to the various people. Uh, Sam has mentioned quite a few uh, thanks, and I'll do some thanks later as well. But let me just read from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 8. And we're going to read from verse 26 down to the end of the chapter at verse 40. So Acts chapter 9, and reading from verse 26. And this is the passage we'll be coming back to later in the service as we consider uh, this service and the, the message of it. So Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 26, let us hear the word of God. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Amen, and we thank God for the reading of his word. Girls and boys, it's lovely to see you here in First Saintfield this morning, and I know there's Second Saintfield people here as well. If you'd like to come down to the front now, I'm going to speak to you as the children's talk. So come on down to the front. I know you don't know me, and I don't know you, but we'll have a, a chat together, and let's hear uh, from God. So, good morning, girls and boys. Have we got voices today? My name is, well, I suppose if I'm the teacher today, you, may, you don't call me, by the first, do, you, do you call your teachers in school by their first names? Yeah. No, you wouldn't do that through you. We'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? So, my name's Mr. Murray. So, good morning, girls and boys. Good morning, Mr. Murray. <laughs> great, great. I'm sure you can do better, mind you. Good morning, girls and boys. Good morning, Mr. Murray. Great, okay. So hands up just so that I know, who's from 1st Seinfeld? Okay, hands down. Who's from 2nd Seinfeld? Okay, hands down. Anyone from any other church? Nope, so that's 1st and 2nd Seinfeld today. Now I've got something with me, but I've got two things with me this morning. And we're going to just talk about, about these for a moment. First one is, is these. What, 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 what are these? Yes? But not what's your name? 
Jack. Thanks, Jack. So this is a set of binoculars. Anybody ever looked through a set of binoculars before? Okay. Tell me when you might look through a set of binoculars. Bird watching. That's a good one. Okay. So you see a bird up on a tree, and you know the way you can't really see very well if the bird, so you lift your eyes up and you, you focus. Okay. Any time else you might use uh, binoculars? Yeah. Spying on people. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, maybe your neighbours, <laughs> what they're doing. So you might do that. Anybody else? Yeah. Hunting. hunting. Yeah, you might do if you're out hunting for something. I was thinking, what, if you, what about if you go to the seaside? What might you look at the seaside? Yeah. <laughs> Dolphins or ships maybe away out in the distance. You might lift your glasses up to see. Or what about the people in the gallery? Does anybody want to come and have a look at the people in the gallery? Who wants to come and have a look at the people? Come on up. <laughs> Tell me what you see. Look up. In the gallery. I see words. You see words, and what about above the words? It says, verse 1, and, oh, there's people there sitting. And what are the people doing? Smiling, sitting there. Smiling. Anything else? I'm looking at this girl, and she's like, smiling. Well, you're looking at it. I think she's got a boyfriend, but... Okay, no more of that. <laughs> so, um, great, so binoculars, we use binoculars to look at things that are, f that are far away. Here's, here's something else today. When, when might you use one of these? Okay, yep. To look at things small. Now what, what sort of things small might you look at with, what is it called first of all, what's it called? Yep. Magnifying glass, okay. So what might be small you would look at with a magnifying glass? Yeah. Insects, yeah. Tiny insects, maybe ladybirds or spiders. Anything else? Yeah. I don't like spiders. You don't like spiders? Look at very small writing. Or very small writing, yeah. One more. Germs. Germs. <laughs> Dirt, maybe, something like that, okay. So these are, the, you use a magnifying glass, and it, you know the way, if you, go, if you get your eyes tested, they, they'll look into your eyes. And the doctor, if you've got something wrong with your eyes, you've got brown eyes, you've got green eyes, and I can look into your green eyes. Anybody else? You've got blue eyes, and you can look in the blue eyes. What color are mine? Blue or green, I think. They're bluey green, yeah. So. We use magnifying glasses and the optician, maybe they'll look at your eyes or we'll look at in school, maybe in a microscope for things that are very small and magnifying glass. So we have binoculars are for looking at things far away and magnifying glasses are for looking at things very close and making them bigger. And girls and boys, there's something about, two things about God I want you always to remember that in one sense, God is very far away. You can't see him. And if you look through binoculars, you still can't see him. God is high, the Bible says. He is lifted up. He's above us. He's beyond us. He's bigger than us. And when we look through binoculars, we can't see him. But it, the binoculars remind us that God is far away. While the magnifying glass reminds us that God is near. He's, he's both far away and he is near. Remember when Jesus came? If you had been alive when Jesus came, you would have been able to look at the hairs in the back of the hands of Jesus. You would have been able to look into his eyes and see the color of his eyes because Jesus came near. God came near in Jesus. He came to be with us. So in one sense, God is far away, but when Jesus came, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. He is far away, and he is also near. And the Bible doesn't tell us about the color of Jesus' eyes, doesn't tell us any details about what he looked like, but it tells us about Jesus. And the most important thing is to believe in Jesus, to believe in him, and to follow him. To follow him as the one who died for our sins on the cross so that we might one day see God. 
and that we might be with God and we might know God forever and ever and ever. So the psalm says, Psalm 34, oh, magnify the Lord. It means think much of God, think how great God is and think also how near God is in Jesus. He's far away, but he's also near. Same God. And he is wonderful, wonderful to sing about, wonderful to know, and wonderful to tell other people about, to talk about Jesus. And to share how great he is and the miracles and how he died for us and how he rose from the dead on the third day so that the life of God could be ours. So we're going to sing your hymn. And it's a hymn called This Little Light of mine and I think there's a verse as well which relates to St. Field people as well so we're going to sing that as well and there may be actions as well for this hymn so I don't know who's doing the actions but I know there might be actions so let's all stand with the children and sing this little light So you go out now to Kid Zone in the halls. Firstly, could I thank the Reverend Bostock and the Reverend Torrance and the Kirk Sessions of First and Second Sainfield for the invitation to come here today to First Sainfield and to be your guest preacher and to launch this uh, time, this season of evangelism and of outreach. Um, before I do that, I bring with me the greetings of the General Assembly um, of our Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And at my installation back in June, I spoke about the need to evangelize or fossilize, the need to reach out or die out. And one of the reasons I took Mighty to Save as the theme for my year from the prophecy of Isaiah is because of the secular hostile culture in which we are living. We're often tempted to retreat and to bunker down and just to hope things will just pass and we'll just keep our heads down and say nothing and not be noticed and hopefully we'll be okay. But by choosing Mighty to Save, it's a reminder uh, that God isn't bunkered down. God isn't bullied into silence. 
but God has a mission. God has a plan being worked out to save men and women, young people, boys and girls from their sins and to gift them with the life of the age that is to come. And I'm really glad, really delighted to hear that here in Stainfield, I think you must have been ahead of me, that would have been planned before, I think, the installa my installation in June. I'm really glad to hear you have this joint mission planned with your friends also in the Church of Ireland. I think this is the Church of Ireland Rector, maybe has uh, come, come in as well today. But the working together in itself sends out a message that, that, that the, the work of the gospel is bigger than any one congregation. It's bigger than any one denomination. And I'm delighted that you have Rico Tice coming in February time to, to speak at, at your time, uh, of your, your weekend time as well. But what about in the meantime? Are we just going to leave it to the professionals? Is passing on the Christian message just for Rico Tice and for Sam and for John and for your Church of Ireland rector? Is, is that all? We leave it to the few, the elite, and everyone else just kind of follows along afterwards. And this is why I've read from Acts chapter 8 this morning and the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, admittedly, Philip was an evangelist. But it's a one-to-one -one conversation in the middle of nowhere, in a wilderness, in a chariot, between two men of very different social classes, very different nationalities, and yet God is in it. And by the end of the conversation, the Ethiopian eunuch has discovered that God is mighty to save, that Jesus Christ is his savior, and the man goes on his way rejoicing. And I want to draw out from this passage of scripture this morning in Acts chapter eight, some general guidelines for all of us, not just for the, the ministers, but for all of us that if we want to be involved in the work of winning souls for the kingdom of God, and the book of Proverbs says, he that winneth souls is wise, then we can learn from this event in Acts chapter 8. Every single one of us, I'm going to use illustrations through my talk of, of how uh, different times uh, I've been involved in one-to-one -one conversa conversations with very different people. The first thing we must believe is that God from all eternity has planned to save a people. That God has planned from all eternity to bring sons and daughters into his family, to adopt them. No longer lost, no longer on the broad road that leads to destruction, but to bring them to the narrow road that leads to life, that they might become part of the flock and the fold of God. 1 Timothy 2 says, God our Savior wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 says, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all men and women to come to eternal life. So let's not listen to the devil who tells us that God no longer saves people in the way that he used to, or that modern people are too hard or they're too busy to be saved or that the spirit is working in Africa or South America or Asia but not really saving people in Europe anymore. Don't listen to the devil because Jesus said the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations and the all nations are mentioned in the Isaiah reading that we had earlier as well. So here's Philip the evangelist in Acts chapter 8. He's from Palestine. He's a Jewish background believer. The Ethiopian eunuch is an Ethiopian, most probably a black man. But God doesn't see class or creed or color. God only sees those who are lost and who need a savior. And Philip himself has been found by Christ. You can read that in John chapter 1. And now he is being used by God to find the Ethiopian eunuch. Because God so loves the world, even a world that is in rebellion, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I hope you and I hope I have a heart for people to see them come to know the Lord. Because from all eternity, 
God has in mind a people whom he is salvaging out of the wreckage of the human race. I had a conversation on Friday morning with an elderly gentleman. He told me he was 79 years of age. Never met him before. A real east, east end of London man. He really emphasized that he was from the east end of London. He went through his life story with me and he told me story. He could really talk. He told me story after story after story about his jobs and where he, li where he lives now and how the area has changed. And I listened to him and he, he went on different details about his family and so on. It's very interesting just listening to him as, as we just got talking in a casual way. I just bumped into him, never met him before, probably never meet him again. But in the middle of the conversation, and believe you me, it was only him doing the talk and I was just listening, he took the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in vain. And when he finished what he was telling me, I said to him, you know, you mentioned Jesus Christ there in your, your, converse, in your, your, your stories. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? And he went off then and what people often do you know, well, I'm a good person, I'm not religious, I always try to help my neighbor and all of that sort of stuff. And I brought him back again. I said, well, what about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins on the cross? There's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to avoid. Now, I'm not saying he became a Christian, but it was just simply I was trying to find some way to witness to the man, to talk about Jesus. You see, it's not high-tech evangelism, and the stories I'm going to tell today as well, please do not think I'm an expert in evangelism. Often I come away from conversations thinking, I should have said this, I should have said that, I should have said something. I'm not an expert by any means. But I do believe that God has a plan to save people, and God is at work to bring them home. The second principle I want to draw out of this scripture today is our need to be sensitive to the work of God's Spirit. In other words, to be listening to the gentle promptings of God the Holy Spirit that he would have us speak to someone about the gospel. God wants you to do that. He wants me to do that. And just to be open to those little opportunities that come along. Last year I went to a conference in London and on the plane, you know how you, you have a book with you or a magazine or you're listening to something on your phone and you just want to sit and have a quiet conversation. The man beside me wanted to talk. He's from County Tyrone. And all I wanted was a quiet flight. But he wanted to talk. And he talked and he talked and he talked. He was a, a builder who was on his, his way to London. And I thought, well, if he wants to talk, I'm going to talk to him about the Lord. And it transpired as we talked. He was a Roman Catholic man, but some of his family had married evangelical, born-again Christians. And that led then to talking about Jesus. Again, I'm not saying he became a Christian, but when I got on that plane, I had no intention. I just wanted a quiet flight. But the conversation opened up, and I was listening to what God was, I believe, saying to me to talk to the man about the Lord Jesus Christ. Or during the week, that same week, I was staying in a B&B &B, um, near King's Cross Station. I went down for breakfast to the breakfast room. It was quite a small place. There was me and there was a, a slightly younger lady uh, in the dining room. And we got talking about the weather as you do, just the two of us. And she commented on my Northern Ireland accent. She dropped her English accent at that point and she started to speak in a Northern Ireland accent. <laughs> because she had been born and brought up in County Down. She had gone to my wife's church and belonged to my wife's church, Mourn, in Kilkeel. And I got talking to her. She had lost her way spiritually. And I encouraged her to get back to a good Bible preaching church. Again, I'm not saying to you that I'm an expert in evangelism, but answer this question. What were the chances in a city of nine million people that I would bump into someone who grew up in my wife's church? 
Was God not in that? Now, I don't know what has happened in that girl's life. Didn't keep up any contact with her. But who knows how God was using that and how God will use you if you're open to being used, sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit, to encourage someone even to come to church or to come to this mission that's coming up. You've got to be open to those God moments and stop rushing. Stop being on to your next thing all the time. Give people time. Forget the to-do list. Be an evangelist in season and out of season as God opens doors for you to be used as an instrument in his hands. Thirdly, it will mean you have to be brave. And Philip here in the Gaza Road was surely brave. I'm guessing as he heard God say to him, go to that chariot and stay near to it, near to it he must have thought, there's so many reasons for not going near that chariot. There's probably guards. Because the, the Ethiopian eunuch gave an order for the chariot to stop. There were probably guards with swords. Probably it looked foreign. He doesn't speak my language probably, so why would I go and talk to him? Probably it looked very wealthy, and Philip probably wasn't dressed in very wealthy clothes. He'll not want anything to do with the likes of me. But verse 29 says, Philip ran up to the chariot. That was a brave thing to do. And Philip, as he took his courage in his hands, was ready to get alongside this man. And as he did so, what a reward he got as he hears the man reading out loud Isaiah the prophet. In Bible times, people didn't read into themselves as we do. They read it read out loud. And he hears Isaiah. His, his ears must have changed. I can't believe this, the timing of this. He's reading Isaiah chapter 53, the most messianic chapter in the whole of the Old Testament. Be on the lookout for those little moments where there's a timing. And you say to yourself, this can only be the Lord, the timing of this, that I have arrived at just this moment. Do you understand what you are reading? How can I, said the Ethiopian eunuch, unless someone explains it to me? So he said to Philip, come on up into the chariot and explain it to me. Remember years ago, picking up a hitchhiker you hardly ever see hitchhikers nowadays. This is years ago. He was a young Dutch man with very good English. And as we were driving down the, a, the, the A26 towards Antrim, we got talking about the things of God. He said he had no time for all of that stuff, he didn't believe the Bible. So I said to him, have you ever read the Bible? Never read it, he said. So I gave him the one that I had in my car and told him to start at Mark's Gospel or John's Gospel. I can't remember what it was. But that was a God moment. Ecclesiastes says, cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. It would have been very easy for me just to have given the man a lift that would have helped him on his way. But God's word is a light for our path and a lamp for our, for our feet. So screw up your courage, gird up your loins. Pass on a tract or a gospel or a testament or a Bible with a wee word of instruction. Go to John's gospel or go to Mark's gospel or try and pray and say, God, if you're there, show me. Fourthly, work out what God is already doing in their lives. Because God will already be at work in people. Tozer said, before a man can seek God, God must first have sought the man. God is always previous. God is already at work in that person's life. The Ethiopian eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So this was a man who had seen through the gods of Ethiopian tribalism and was looking for the one true and living God. And he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. When there he had bought a scroll of the prophet Isaiah, to you and to me, you just bought a book of the Bible, but there were no faith mission bookshops in Isaiah. There were no printing presses. The Jews copied the scriptures by hand, very hard to come by, very expensive, and they didn't just sell them to anybody. But here's a man 
probably he's paid a lot of money for the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. But he's hungry for God and he's got the word of God. And he's got to Isaiah 53, led like a lamb to the slaughter, silent like a lamb before the shearer, humiliated, deprived of justice. And he says to Philip, who is he talking about? And Philip starts to talk about the cross and the suffering of Jesus and his blood shed to atone for our sins on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Some of you may know the name of Roger Carswell, who's an evangelist from Yorkshire. Roger's a remarkable evangelist. I took part in a mission with him in Coleraine many years ago. And when we went into the shops, he would have asked the shop assistants their names. And if they're Bible names, then he started to tell them the, the story of their person in the Bible. He was brought up to go to church, but in, in the Lebanon, uh, uh, he played tennis with his uncle one day. And after the tennis match, his uncle shared with him some verses from the books of, book of Romans that there is a God, that he, Roger, had sinned against God, that the sin of the world was laid on Jesus. And then his uncle said this, Roger, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You can listen to it on podcasts and wiki, on uh, Spotify. Just type in Roger Carswell and you'll get his life story. And that day, as his uncle, for the first time in his life, sharing the gospel with him, he turned from his sin and asked Christ to forgive him and come and live in his life. Roger calls it the hinge that changed his whole direction. Could you not sit down with your children and share the gospel with them, or your grandchildren, or your nieces, or your nephews? Take them out for a game of tennis or to the 10 pin bowling, or to the, out for a walk someday, or to the swimming pool, and share with them the gospel. So often we're not God's chosen people, we're God's frozen people. We can't speak it, we struggle to say. And so the training events will be helpful for you, which are coming up, you'll see, on the flyer. The fifth and final principle I want to draw out today is how we should be prepared to trust God for what God is doing and to take that step or that leap to reach out to someone, believing that God will be with us. The Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip in verse 37, why shouldn't I be baptized? And then Philip the eunuch and the eunuch went both down into the water and Philip baptized him. Now it was early days, barely minutes a believer. But Philip was prepared to act in faith, to believe this was of God and not to think this was just a random event. If you think of seed that is planted at seed time by the farmers, we, heard about, we sang about seed time earlier in the psalm. When seed is being planted in the ground, it looks pointless. Why would you bury seed in the ground? But within that seed, there is a life force. And when it germinates, not if it germinates, when it germinates, it produces fruit 160 or 30 times what was sown. We live in a day and age when men and women are hungry hungry for meaning, hungry for purpose, hungry for something that will be bigger than the lives that they have, hungry for God. And we have the opportunity to bring the seed of God's word. Tozer again, the Kodum said, the modern scientist has lost God amidst the wonders of the world, but we Christians are in real danger of losing God among the wonders of his word. You see, the scriptures bear witness to Jesus Christ. It's just not come to our Bible story. These talk to us about Jesus Christ. It's a living, personal relationship with the Christ who died for us on the cross and rose again. Him we proclaim. Put his word on our notice boards. Hand over literature that's attractive. Organize gospel missions. Gossip the gospel at the school gate. Organize Christianity explored courses, men's breakfasts, women's coffee mornings, children's camps, farmers' barbecues with vintage machinery. Just be imaginative to point people to Jesus. Because God is alive, He's not dead. 
And he is at work to bring people to know Jesus. For this, said Jesus, is eternal life, that they know me, the living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life's not knowing the Bible off by heart or being able to say Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and kind of know all those type of things. Eternal life is knowing Jesus personally. So talk about Jesus as opportunities open. So I commend you for your plans for the new year, but don't leave so winning until then. But this is something we are always to be about. Lord, use me today. Lord, help me today. Lord, give me words today. Lord, may I be someone who is keen to share my faith even in the most simple of ways. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this record of Philip meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch on this desert road, a place where there was nothing, so unpromising, hardly anything growing, no water, no life, a desert, sand and stones and hot sun. But we thank you that in that desert place, you brought forth life. And we thank you, Father, that that life was planted into the Ethiopian eunuch who came alive, who was born again. And we thank you, Father, that he received the gift of eternal life. And we praise you, Father, for just how his life was turned around. He found meaning. He found true wealth. He found the family of God. We pray, Father, for these congregations as they embark upon this time of evangelism and outreach and mission. We thank you for the vision behind it. And we pray that as people gather and people are motivated and energized to be part of this outreach, that, Father, you will, by your Spirit, be at work now, right now, in people's hearts and minds and lives in this area. May it be that this time next year there are people sitting here or in Second Saint Field or in the Church of Ireland who perhaps today have no interest whatsoever in church, but this time next year they'll be saved because of this outreach. And they're keen Christians and they're wanting to walk with God. Father, we pray for Rico as he comes to speak. We pray for others, Lord, who will be involved in training. And we ask that your spirit, Lord, will lead and guide, just as you led and guided Philip to leave a, a busy place and to go to a desert place, but you were in that. And help us not to despise the day of small things, but to be open to what you, the God who is mighty to save, are doing. We pray, Father, for places today where Christians are persecuted, we think of China, we think of Korea, we think of Saudi Arabia, we think of the Middle East, we think of Nigeria, we think, Father, of Christians who, with all the pressures that are on them and often state forces watching them, they're witnessing, they're seeing amazing growth. And Father, we're astonished when we hear that the number of Christians in China today is more than the members of the Communist Party in China. Father, bless your people in those countries. Use them as they witness. And help us, Father, to be mindful of our privileges and not, Lord, to waste them. We pray today, too, for those who are ill in this area, those who are perhaps in our hearts for different reasons, people, Lord, whose, whose lives are difficult, Perhaps mental health is not good or bodily health is not good. Maybe there's worries in their families. No doubt in a congregation like this this morning, there are many cares, many concerns. Lord, we pray that you will reach out and in compassion touch lives today. Father, even in the silence, we just name people who are on our hearts. And Father, we name people today who are not Christians in our families. And we pray you'll bring them to Christ. And Father, we bring our prayers to you. 
through the name of Christ, our Savior. Let's stand then and sing our concluding hymn, O Church, Arise. And what a reminder to us that we're not to sit around doing nothing, but we are to arise and be agents in the hands of God. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen. Well, that's the conclusion of our service, but just a few uh, announcements as we finish our time together. First of all, uh, thank you very much to Richard for bringing God's word uh, to us today. Really appreciate you being with us. Uh, this morning, Richard, and thank you to for John uh, for uh, leading us in prayer, and thank you to everybody who's made this service run so smoothly. Um, thank you for all the people who have prepared extra food and drink and looked after extra numbers of kids. Uh, so it would have run smoothly apart from me uh, forgetting the microphone uh, on. So sorry about that, but everything else I think was smooth apart from my involvement. Um, 
if you're a member of First St. Field, uh, hopefully you have received on your way in a copy of the bulletin and the prayer diary for this upcoming month. If you haven't got those, uh, please do take those away. Um, that has got obviously a number of items for our own church family over the next uh, month. So I won't say too much about that just now, but I do want to flag up the mission flyer that hopefully you've received. And if you haven't got one of these, please do grab one of these on your way out. This is sort of an in-house flyer, so this isn't our kind of big thing that we're wanting to share with the village at this point in time, but this is really just for the three congregations, just to raise awareness of what we're hoping to do uh, this autumn and then in the new year with Rico Tice coming. Um, we're, as, uh, as Richard was saying, we've, we've been inspired as three congregations to want to join up together to share the good news of Jesus with our town. We think that together we can hopefully make more of an impact uh, on our, our town for Christ. Uh, we have got Rico Tice coming. Some of you will be familiar with Rico. He's a really well-known uh, evangelist. He, he travels around the world speaking about Jesus. He's the author of the Christianity Explored course, which Richard mentioned, which many people have found uh, valuable. And actually, many of us will remember Rico because he was in St. Field, I believe, 20 or so years ago when the three churches came together uh, to have a mission at that point. So we're really looking forward to welcome, welcoming Rico back uh, in February. Uh, but as Richard said... This really isn't about the professionals uh, doing things uh, uh, as if it could be. This is something that we want uh, all of our congregations to be involved in. Uh, and so this autumn, we're, we're trying to build up to the, to the mission uh, by having a time of evangelism training. You see, we've got three sessions there, Wednesday, the 2nd of October, the 6th of November, and the 27th of November. Uh, we'd love it if everybody could put those sessions in their diaries and, and try and make it a priority to come along to those. Uh, we, we hope that there'll be times of encouragement and equipping as we try and take up uh, this call that we've heard to today uh, to share our faith with others. I know lots of us probably recognise that we're meant to be doing that, but we perhaps often feel guilty, don't we, about, about struggling to do that. So we hope that those times won't be times when we come away feeling burdened or, or feeling bad about how little we've done, but hopefully feeling encouraged and helped to share our faith in ways that will be natural uh, and, and, and sort of easy for us. Um, those are the three evangelism training things, but really we're kicking things off this Wednesday evening, the 4th of September at 7.45 with what we're calling a vision night. Uh, we're not quite ready to call it a launch night because there's lots of things that sort of still need to be put in place, but we did want to share something of the vision uh, for this mission, explain maybe how things are working, uh, what the warm-up events might involve in January, uh, how the mission itself might look uh, in February. So again, we'd love it if as many people as possible could come along on Wednesday evening. That's going to be held in Second Presbyterian Church Halls, 7.45 to 9 p.m. To hear a little bit more about the inspiration for this, uh, for this series of events and how we're hoping it will sort of fit together uh, and work over the next while. Uh, just a few more announcements. Uh, firstly, this evening, we're gathering together again for an opportunity to pray at 6.30 in the Guild Hall. And then 7 p.m. we have our uh, Sunday night church. We're going to be carrying on the series that we've been looking at of being human uh, this Sunday evening. And tonight, we're going to be thinking about what it means as human beings to be in a covenant with God that we've broken in Adam. Uh, this is a, a topic that many of the people who did the communicant class uh, course with me in the, uh, earlier this year found quite new and also quite uh, clarifying. So I'm hoping that will be the case for all of us uh, this evening. If you're able to come along, if you don't have anything else uh, to be doing, seven o'clock for worship and for being human, covenant breakers. Uh, communion uh, is going to be held uh, next Sunday morning for members of uh, First St. Field. Um, but for now, uh, we have no rush away. Uh, if you're able to, there are double quantities of tea and coffee available down here at the front. It'd be lovely to, to get to know uh, each other in our different congregations. So if you are able to stay and enjoy a cup of tea and coffee or some juice, uh, it'd be great to get to know you more over those uh, times of fellowship. Thank you very much.